Well, good morning all, and uh, welcome to our Business Survival Guide webinar. If anybody needs to get in touch with us in, after the event, there's some contact details there, an email address uh, or a phone number, of course, you can visit our website. Uh, Rinska is someone who has spoken right throughout uh, various countries, Asia and Africa and Europe, on disaster recovery business continuity planning. Uh, she's in Malaysia today, uh, delivering a, a five-day um, session uh, event, and um, she's been specialising in business continuity and disaster recovery planning now for over 15 years. Um, as you can see from the screen, she's certainly very certified and qualified, and uh, I'd like to hand over to Rinska, who's going to take you through the business continuity planning side of, uh, of the event. So, uh, Rinska, over to you. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks for the uh, for the introduction, Andrew. Um, yeah, hopefully um, um, we can get through some of the, the, the issues that you face and some of the potential solutions that you might consider. I've called it the top 10 best practice tips for your business continuity plan um, because I think at least out of those 10, hopefully you can get five or six that you, you can actually implement um, if you like today or tomorrow and that are not uh, rocket science or too complex or too costly type solutions. So um, if we start off by trying to sort of grab the scope here, um, many people that I, that I speak to in their BCP, the only thing that's, um, that's in there is things related to their building or their IT systems um, and, uh, and how to protect those and how to respond to any events that challenge those particular uh, aspects. But when it comes to things like uh, denial of access to your building, your building might be there, but you might have no access or there might be road closures and things like that. Um, there might be a, a flu outbreak where your staff is challenged um, actually uh, either getting to work because their children are sick or their family members need some looking after. And um, yeah, they're the sort of events that often in VCPs I find missing. In fact, blatantly obvi obvious, sometimes it states in the beginning of a business continuity plan that um, we cater for any scenario except anything to do with staff. Um, and we assume that all our staff are available, which um, is obviously not the right assumption to make when you make a business continuity plan. Um, some of the other aspects you see on the screen here, you know, your phone system might be down, the rest of the business might be running fine, but what about if your telephony is not working? Often I find that very, very under-planned in most business continuity plans. People tend to focus on those IT um, and, and building related aspects. So a couple of statistics, some form of, um, of statistic you can always find in these, uh, in these situations. Whether they're perfectly correct, it doesn't matter, but I've, I've reviewed um, uh, reinsurance companies, you see here Gartner, Institute of Crisis Management, and the sort of weighted average of all of those, you find that these sorts of uh, statistics come out. So if there's no plan at all, if a business doesn't have any continuity plans at all, um, and they have a significant uh, disaster hitting them, you find that 43% on average say that they don't even reopen the doors the next day, uh, that they don't know where to start, basically. And um, the 80% fail in over just a year, uh, or in just over a year. The, um, uh, yeah, the other statistics here are even more shocking in a way. Uh, less than 10% last over five years if they had a significant data loss. Now, uh, you can imagine if there's any form of data loss or data leakage and security issues around that, the reputational damage to your business can be so big, even if you... Um, if you've resolved the issue um, and responded to it, it's, uh, it's the brand that's damaged so badly that um, yeah, most say that in five years' time we're pretty much gone. Um, the, the last statistics there, um, the 82% the of disasters are caused by internal or people issues. That's actually good news in a way because that's the sort of things that you can actually do something about. So even if you say, look, you know, we had a, uh, a telecommunications failure or, or something that affected our business, often it can be brought back to a training or a process related issue where we all know that some of the telcos, you know, they may cut the wrong cable when they're doing some works on the street or things like that. Um, and yes, it's actually not a, a technical uh, fault it's, or, or some large scale disaster. It's actually just a person sometimes that's not trained well. Um, and like I said, that is in a way good news because we can actually do something about those sorts of events. So if we start looking a little bit more at why would we do business continuity uh, right now, even though there may never be a disaster that actually will affect us, um, these are some of the immediate benefits that some of my clients are mentioning. Um, their business interruption insurance policy, they can either not even get one if they don't have a BCP, or they're paying a larger uh, premium every year on, uh, on getting one of those policies. So 
Uh, some of my clients report 8 to 10 percent discount on their business interruption insurance bill, and it only uh, well obviously depends on your business as to how much that would equate to. Um, so that's one really um, really good immediate benefit that you can uh, obviously sell up to the to the board and uh, get buy-in straight away. The next one there, um, stakeholder confidence. That could be um, your staff, your shareholders, uh, your general public. Uh, suppliers, clients, and so on, uh, confidence in your business. In fact, some businesses pr promote the fact that they have a business continuity plan actively on their website or in tender responses and so on. So it's actually um, uh, yeah, a real benefit there. Uh, better dollar decisions or uh, investment decisions. If you have a good business continuity process and you've assessed really what the risks are and what those impacts are on your business potentially, you can then make an informed decision on where you can invest your money instead of just getting um, uh, certain uh, you know, uh, solutions like DR sites and hot failover for all your systems. If you have a, uh, a balanced perspective on all of that and knowing where you, should over, uh, where, you should, where you should not over or under invest, that is obviously a much better solution. Uh, the last two points there, competitive advantage, I already mentioned something related to that and better day-to-day -day business. Some people, they start doing business continuity planning and they find that they they discover certain parts of that business that have either duplication of effort going on or people not being uh, working optimally together because not many other people have actually looked end to end at all the business processes and when you do business continuity planning you start seeing some of those uh, those gaps or those um, doubling up type situations so you can actually streamline the business in that way and again some of my clients actually say that is actually the reason why we want business continuity planning to, you know, to, to begin with, actually um, uh, yeah, optimizing our processes uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, um, a couple of pitfalls there. Real-life comments from companies post-disaster. Some of you guys, um, or at least two-thirds of you, have um, maybe some sort of affinity with these. The first one is uh, the press jumped onto us and we, had, we hadn't included that in our, pla in our plans. So those um, contact details of journalists and so on, we couldn't actually grab them when it, um, when it was a problem. Um, the next one, we didn't know who should do what or who should make decisions when some of the key people were not there. Uh, the, the management team sometimes relies on their own reports to be there or their own um, managers down the line. And if there's some disruptive scenario going on and you can't get a hold of all those people, well, you might have to make decisions on other people's behalf, and that's not always natural to senior management teams. So these are the sort of things that you can rehearse and you can, um, yeah, you can include in your testing. We depended on the contract with suppliers, but they didn't help us in time. Very, very common uh, point. People think, oh, it's covered in a contract. We've got a three-hour response time with our, let's say, our telephony provider or our IT supplier. And when uh, something goes wrong and it's not just your business, that is knocking on the door of these sorts of suppliers, suddenly that three hour response time goes out the window. In fact, even if it's, it's just you knocking on their door, on their door it often um, appears that in all the testing that I've done that actually the, those response times and those um, service level agreements are not even valid or, uh, or remotely achievable. So it's very, very um, smart to include these sorts of aspects in your testing and really build a relationship with your suppliers to uh, test and regularly validate that, um, that BCM capability. Um, the next one, we had planned for anything but people issues and in the end we didn't realize how many staff wanted to take time out to deal with issues at home and that aspect wasn't included in our plans. So uh, earthquakes and floods are really good examples of those. You may have a fine building and fine systems but if your staff are dealing with different priorities, yeah, what is then your plan to get quickly access to skilled workforce? We couldn't get a hold of everyone and had no plan for alternates is another comment. So the communication and notification collaboration sort of uh, processes are often very poorly rehearsed and poorly documented and there are more and more tools available to streamline these but many people haven't even considered them or can't get buy-in to get um, investment into those sorts of notification tools like SMS broadcasting, uh, internal you know, tweet systems and things like that. So the next one there, keeping everyone constantly informed what, uh, wasted a lot of time. It's not just the initial notification that you have to give your suppliers and your staff, but also you've got to keep them informed about the next step. That may be a, a one or two hourly um, event where you have to try and give them that information. Well, the problem is often um, uh, yeah, the, the, the time that it requires from managers and team leaders to keep their staff and also the external suppliers involved and informed is, uh, is an enormous time waster. 
The next one is uh, the assumption was to SMS and call every, everyone on the mobile, but the mobile network went down with the power outages. So these are the sort of things that, especially in the earthquakes in New Zealand, were reported, but also the floods in, uh, in Queensland. Uh, mobile network uh, coverage is uh, doubtful sometimes anyway. You only have to go to a, a sport event and knowing that the, four, the first 45 minutes after the match, you can't even get a hold of anyone. Um, I've, I've seen and heard that many times. And um, yeah, it's also, uh, what about your battery? You're standing outside the building, you might not be able to get in there, and um, when your battery's flat on your, uh, on your iPhone, uh, well, often that happens within an hour of making some, uh, some calls. So yeah, what's, uh, what's the next step then? And often it's, uh, yeah, it's a problem to, uh, to resolve that quickly. So a couple of other pitfalls and real life comments from companies post disaster. Um, we got distracted with things that in the end didn't matter, whilst more critical stuff didn't get done. That is one of the most frustrating ones, obviously, that if you had some idea of prioritization up front, you would have uh, been able to do a few things perfectly rather than everything half. The next one, staff and customers jumped onto Facebook and Twitter and we didn't have anyone moderating or responding. Now this one is really your uh, opportunity as well because if you do this properly, if you do this well, you can actually gain an enormous amount of advantage. There's some examples like AirAsia, they had a, a plane which was flying off the, off the runway and because they're straight onto their Facebook and Twitter accounts and moderating questions from people, from next of kin, from customers, um, they really gained a, a competitive advantage over other uh, organizations that didn't even, ha didn't even have a Facebook account. And many said the way that they responded gave them more faith in the company, even though they really just had a disaster going on. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that you can, uh, you can benefit from. And the last one, often I find my clients say it happens on payday, and this is not a joke, it's actually true. Many people say um, it's all often the wrong time of the year, the wrong time of the month, just on that day when we have a pay run going on uh, that, uh, that this sort of thing ha happens to us. And yeah, the double uh, challenge uh, hits there. So very valid um, information, I think, from these, uh, these people. Um, more reasons for business continuity. Um, real disasters obviously can happen. We've talked about Queensland floods and New Zealand earthquakes now. But what about Perth bushfires over the years? Um, union strikes, they impact on your staff not on your building perhaps, but on your staff, and maybe even a lockout of your building if you're uh, very unfortunate. Um, we've got heat waves um, hitting uh, sometimes Victoria, but also uh, we've seen it in, uh, in New South Wales as well. Um, the related um, or unrelated utility shortages and outages um, and the rations that are um, put upon us if there is some sort of, uh, let's say, heat wave or something that impacts on the utility uh, capability. Um, you've got to be pretty much a hospital or an emergency service to get any form of electricity and if you're a commercial business and you're just um, uh, you're selling products that are not time critical to the community, you uh, probably have to um, uh, shut down part of your building. Now, other things like dust storms, volcanic ash cloud, and so on, they're real life events and most of my clients would say they didn't have anything in their BCPs to cater for those. Um, oil spills, they're all the, uh, the reputational sort of damage, what we saw with, uh, with BP and so on. And again, the link with your media response policy should be fairly uh, tightly integrated with your BCP because sometimes that initial response is all you have at your, uh, at your disposal to, um, to use. Um, there may be more examples from, um, from Australia but also across the world. Um, tsunami in Japan, um, we had the uh, volcanic ash cloud in, uh, in Europe but also then the, uh, the, the Chile, um, uh, Chilean uh, cloud and those sorts of events, I mean it goes on and on. Uh, across Asia, we've seen, seen an, an human, numerous amounts of floods and, uh, and uh, things that are related to tsunamis and so on. So it's, uh, it's pretty much every uh, second week or so that you read something that you can uh, relate to. Okay, um, this little slideshow, some of you guys may have seen this. Um, this is what I show to, to show people the risks of not having a proper BCP but just doing an ad hoc response, a band-aid type solution if there's a disaster. Uh, we'll cross the bridge when we get to it type approach. Well, what does that mean if you, um, if you stick with that approach? We see here a little disaster that happened. A white car ended up in the water. That may be a pretty small disaster that really nobody had that many problems with, but someone said, let's fix it. And, well, here it goes on and goes on, and here we see that the fix it or the band-aid actually creates more of a problem than the initial uh, little small disaster that you had on, uh, to deal with. So what we see next is uh, another Band-Aid solution, another ad hoc response to that, and um, obviously we can see what happens when we keep on clicking away. 
And the last slide, even though it's, um, um, I have to be honest, it's a hoax, but someone obviously saw what was going on here and uh, Band-Aid solutions often don't really help you in the long run. So when you have that kind of approach to business continuity planning and your, uh, and your senior management team or your general staff have no buy-in into the process, I think you've got some work to do because um, people who think uh, we'll fix it when it hits us. They, um, yeah, they may see that it's more dangerous situations in the situation to the business in the end. Okay, a couple of slides here with uh, terms. Um, just really showing you that a disaster is not something that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the words or the terms have to be explained fairly clearly up front to most of your workforce. Otherwise, people all have a different thing in their mind when someone says there's a disaster. So you might have um, junior staff in, uh, in IT who know if the CEO is not working because their laptop is affected by something, they might call that a disaster, but really, would you call that a disaster in the larger scheme of things? In your, uh, in your business continuity plan, it probably wouldn't be labeled a disaster. It would just be um, uh, an, uh, an event that you know there's a fix for and you can deal with without having too much impact on your core business outcomes. Now, when that's the case, we don't call things disasters in this whole BCP arena. So, um, yeah, disaster is usually sudden, unplanned, calamitous event, something that you haven't planned for uh, and that creates an inability uh, on an organization's part to provide critical business functions for some predetermined period of time. So you already think beforehand what would really be a challenge to us, a few minutes versus a few hours versus a couple of weeks. Disaster recovery is then the whole um, set of activities and programs designed to return the organization to an acceptable condition post-disaster. And it still has, still has a technical IT sort of system focus, but it also includes uh, other provisions like accommodation, phone and fax services, and workstations, and so on. So it's not a, um, a pure IT issue anymore. In fact, most organizations now talk about ITDR when they really want to talk about the IT systems disaster recovery plans, rather than saying DR, which could be also your desks and your phones and your seating and so on for staff. Now, BCP. Um, the difference with DR is that BCP really has more an end-to-end -end focus and also a more um, uh, before, during, and after disaster type focus. So it's a holistic process and really is supposed to ensure that your business can continue no matter what happens and that it's um, yes, ensuring the viability of your organization uh, before, during, and after a disruption, like I said. Um, so it's more an end-to-end -end business process, and it's uh, not always that you have to declare a disaster if your BCP is properly documented and developed and tested. Um, in fact, some of my clients say we sometimes go to DR systems, and we don't even notice it because it's active-active, just like what Professional Advantage implements with some of the clients. You know, there are very advanced solutions there, and some of you may have those, and you don't even know if something flicks over to the DR side. So, that's a, a seamless process which, we, which falls under the category of business continuity or service continuity planning rather than DR or disaster recovery. So it's more about continuing that business no matter what happens. Okay, um, relationships between those processes that I just mentioned. Um, you've got BCM, which is business continuity management, the overall management process that also includes things like your risk assessments and chart staff training on the business continuity plan. The BCP being the documented process around that, so your plans that you want to activate in case something happens. And then DR is really a subset of that. So disaster recovery procedures are a subset of business continuity planning end to end. Um, it's usually, usually just the uh, certain thresholds exceeding type scenarios. That's when you have those um, DR plans activated. And then we've got IT service continuity management, which sits over um, the BCP and DR together because it does talk about business um, requirements and it does look at those, uh, those requirements that all the business departments have, but it only focuses on IT aspects. So it doesn't actually um, uh, look at anything like the desks and the phones and the, well, sometimes the phones, but at least not the desks and the food and the, um, you know, the showers of people if they are locked out of the building and things like that. Okay, then there's uh, one more um, availability management or operational continuity, and that is really in your day-to-day -day business continuity space. So it's not even touching on disaster recovery. This is the, the sort of thresholds where people have their 99.9% .9 uptime, uh, maintenance windows. That's planned maintenance usually. We don't call that anywhere, anywhere near disaster recovery uh, process or plans. So that's how that uh, picture fits together. Okay. The next slide, um, just a couple of things that you might recognize um, and that 
well, with the 10 tips, will hopefully cover some of those uh, issues. The first one, when a business continuity test or rehearsal is suggested, everyone seems to be busy with the production issues or the high priority issues. People tend to want to push the BCP testing on the back burner and, and push it out to next year, next month, and not have uh, full priority um, uh, on that. The, uh, the next one, emergency procedures are published on the internet, but really, when there was, if there's a fire or the building is closed off for some reason, most of your staff would be standing there, hands in the air, not really knowing what to do, where to go, and if they're going to call someone or if someone's going to call them. Uh, one way training our communication is always very risky because you can't measure how many of your staff members actually have understood the message. So very, very common problem uh, in most of my, uh, my clients' organizations. The next one, when your IT or facilities people present a proposal to optimize the DR site or the remote site, the exec executive wonders why to invest money in a dead site. So it's anything that is redundant tends to be not very easily and well supported by people because it seems like you're wasting money. So um, re resilient solutions are definitely the preferred way to go and even incorporate that in your language these days and call everything resilient rather than redundant because it just triggers off people's uh, feeling that you're wasting money. Uh, a little quote here, uh, and this is an actual quote. Whenever you ask me how I can best describe my experiences, uh, nearly 40 years at sea, I merely say uneventful, never been in an accident, never been in a shipwreck. Anyway, this is 1907, um, and what we find that that was in 1912, um, uh, the captain of the Titanic said this in 1907, and in 1912 the, the iceberg uh, was in front of him. Now many CEOs and, uh, and executives that I speak to are actually in that kind of space where they do know stuff could happen, but it's in their minds that it will probably be a different business or a different industry or a different city, and people still need a little bit more of a um, uh, awareness um, training, if you if you like, to you have to get more of that buy-in to the process. Okay, um, other mistakes and misconceptions. We talked about um, uh, a little bit about these sorts of events here with external suppliers, but what about your uh, the disasters like pandemics and terrorism, people think the government will just fix that or help us through that. Well, the government will require help from business as well. So, and plus, the, your, your um, uh, response to a pandemic may be vastly different from other organizations that have a completely different impact from that scenario. So you need to really look at those things for your business and tailor your response to whatever uh, the situation might be. Okay, um, the final point there, business continuity is all about backup tapes. Uh, many of my clients have them sitting on top of the server and only caters for a scenario like a disk failure. So that doesn't really cut it when it comes to um, end-to-end -end business continuity. In fact, how do you continue your whole business just with your data backups? That is uh, obviously not planned for if you don't have any kind of um, people capability or systems running somewhere else that you can actually use that data on. So uh, the backup tapes are not the DR plan in its entirety. Okay, so how do we overcome some of these challenges? The first tip I would say, um, I talked a little bit about those scenarios like volcanic ash and so on. Um, if you want to plan for everything or anything that could go wrong, you're probably still going to miss out on the real life event that will hit you. And um, people sometimes come to me with 158 different strategies on how to deal with anything like the floods, the explosions, the fires, the pandemics and so on. Um, and still, um, there's two problems with it. One is it's not all encompassing, it could still be something different. Uh, and the next problem that it, that, uh, that it has is that most of those strategies have certain overlap lap with others. So um, you end up with a huge document that collects dust very quickly and that has uh, 158 strategies that are overlapping in all sorts of ways. So trying to actually simplify all that and focus on consequence scenarios is probably your best bet. So actually looking at which things cause a uh, unavailability of staff, uh, unaccessibility of the building, uh, your IT systems being down on a large scale, your phones being out of action, and supplier being unavailable. They could be your simple five scenarios you start planning for with your business units. Don't even look at all those detailed other 158. If you start with this, especially with different business departments, they uh, can usually plan with you a lot more easily than having to go into the detail of the 158 special events. So that is my first tip, is really bundle those, uh, those incidents into their consequence rather than the cause. The next one, get relevant insurance. Now, we talked a little bit about um, business interruption insurance, but also key person insurance is one of the things that some businesses take out these days, especially medium-sized businesses uh, or very specialized, skilled uh, workforce. You might say that you need some form of insurance for it. 
uh, it's not cheap, but it's something that you could uh, consider, obviously. And then there's business interruption insurance that helps you through a disaster, but also covers you for the, the, the business loss and the, the income loss if you, um, yeah, if you had to uh, live with or live through some of those events. Okay, the third one there, plan and practice, um, and also be selective. Have the 80-20 rule going. So don't try to cover for every single thing that could um, uh, could be affected in your business, but actually start looking at um, what is time critical in terms of business processes and what are the required resources for those. So things like uh, manual workarounds, they sound nice, but they also require testing and planning. So uh, these ladies here, they've obviously been very selective with uh, choosing their solitaire guard card game as one of the time critical processes. <laughs> but you get the idea here, most businesses try to, they think manual workarounds are cheap or free, so let's just make that a strategy for anything that, uh, that could happen. But still, it requires quite a bit of uh, maintenance, those sorts of uh, workarounds. In fact, some of your younger or new staff, they may not even know what the old way was that things were done. So you need to actually keep them trained in those manual workarounds quite heavily. Okay, the, the tip number four, internal communication uh, groups. So you've got um, different parties you need to deal with, whether it's your staff, next of kin, uh, your own um, other staff in different offices and so on, but also um, how to actually do that. If you don't have the contact details, people tend to uh, maintain mobile numbers for everyone and as uh, I said before, they're standing on the street, people could actually not really access their mobile phone. So what is then the ultimate way to communicate with people? Uh, also, if networks are down, is there maybe still something running like a landline or a home email address? Get those details then of staff and work through your confidentiality and um, uh, data security sort of challenges with staff and say, look, this is really just for disaster recovery purposes. Uh, if something goes wrong, we want you to be part of the uh, of the family, if you like, and help out, but also we will make sure that you are then properly informed that you know what to do, you know, your, your, your partner, your spouse will know what's happening with you. Please um, share that, uh, that information. Another strategy that I've heard um, is um, a, a policy change where you say that um, staff members who, are, uh, who hear of any sort of events uh, that that's impact on the business or on the city that they work in, uh, that they immediately have the responsibility to get in touch with their own manager. So at least if you don't have uh, the ability to contact them, you make it a policy that they have to get in touch with the business. So that could be a strategy around that, uh, that issue. And having some good notification and collaboration platforms in place is obviously one of the important parts as well. Okay, tip number five is external communication. Be proactive and creative. We've seen the Nudie Juice case where the media coverage after they had a fire and responded extremely quickly and extremely well, the media coverage can be an extreme benefit to your business. So uh, use that opportunity and have a good response plan. Communicate about it to everyone, including customers, media, community, suppliers, banks, uh, even the ATO or your landlords. Tell them up front there's a problem and that they should experience some delays with uh, whether it's reporting or payments and so on. Um, instead of being uh, the last person um, that they're going to uh, that they're going to call that you've got to call, um, you want to make sure that they uh, they're pre-informed so that they're not going to not going to knock on your door if uh, if something goes wrong. Uh, web notices and recorded messages are a trick around uh, all of that to streamline that communication. Uh, the next tip, the decision making process. Uh, yes, things are uh, rapidly happening, and your uh, decision makers have to start making decisions based on sometimes lack of information and uh, the, the whole uh, event that they're deciding on, you want to make sure that internal and external messaging is consistent. So if they make a decision, make sure that the, the internal staff know what the decision is but also the external world and that it's not clashing. Um, other things like uh, the phones might not work, have a proper predetermined crisis control room for your senior management team, your crisis management team. Yeah, so don't uh, rely on them just jumping on the phone or having a virtual conversation over um, a virtual boardroom. Actually, uh, having predetermined places like a boardroom in a, um, a partner business or perhaps a hotel boardroom or something like that where they already know, ah, if this building is affected, that's the place I'm going to go to immediately because that's where all the others are going to go and we don't have to think about it when it happens. Tip number seven, dual suppliers for time critical services. Uh, that's your own responsibility. You can't hide behind contracts. You can't say, ah, a supplier made a mistake, so we can't help that. Most organizations now know there is multiple suppliers possible, so they, may, they hold you responsible for having those multiple supplier contracts in place. And also asking your question, um, what is their business continuity plan? How do, do, how do they do their business continuity testing? 
and which suppliers do they depend on. Multitasking by staff is another tip. Uh, really getting one or two alternates doc documented and prepared for things that can go wrong. If their colleague is not there, what can they then grab in terms of documented procedures and so on to actually um, yeah, to continue that part of the, uh, the process. Use the induction process to actually um, uh, train your, your staff or have some external suppliers trained or some of their staff if you think that you don't have enough internal uh, backup capability. Training staff cross-departmentally cross -departmentally is actually a fantastic thing for staff culture as well. So you may find that it initiates a whole different momentum in the organization as well. The second last tip is uh, where will your staff work from? People think, oh, people will just work from home because we, you know, we have all these people linked up with Citrix and they can just do that on the fly. Or they might do it on the fly when uh, only they are uh, ex experiencing a reason for, um, for working from home. But if every single staff member who's got that Citrix license um, on their, or that Citrix software on their desktop, if they all start logging on from home, you might find licensing issues, but also bandwidth and system uh, performance issues. So eligibility is a very important process. And actually having documented who will log on from where is extremely, extremely important. Another thing is, if they're working from somewhere else, how do you divert to the services, whether it's um, deliveries, whether it's phone diversion, you need to have that prepared, obviously. Okay, uh, the last tip here is don't re reinvent the wheel. Use certain templates and frameworks that you feel comfortable with and really fill in the blanks and save yourself weeks instead of trying to invent something from a, uh, a blank piece of paper, which some of our clients are doing and they find that it wastes an enormous amount of time. Some of the examples of uh, the models that I use um, uh, with my clients and the, the kits that I implement with clients as part of consultancy projects, um, and some clients actually get this kit and they want to implement it themselves, that's fine because it's fully um, guided and commented on how to, how to actually do that. But here you see some of the, the pictures or snapshots of what it could look like instead of having a novel style 500 page BCP, which I find with many clients, um, yeah, these sorts of models where it's color coded, matrix style, or a bullet point style, it, it just works a lot better to communicate things across the organization rather than um, having a long document to read. Okay, um, the last couple of slides here. Um, if it's too hard, yeah, just think about the simple things you can start doing now. Build good BCP teams, as in involve the right people in your business. Uh, focus on some uh, key threats and simple scenarios. Look at, for your business, what are the bottlenecks? So ask a couple of champions in the business and say, what do you think is the biggest challenge for our business if, for example, we're locked out of the building or the systems are down or a supplier is out of action, what do you see as the biggest bottleneck? And the last point, checklist style plans, as I said before. So further steps towards a better PCP, um, a health check could help. Um, you can either get uh, a consultant to do that or you can get a good framework and actually use one of the standards out there. Uh, and use it as your own inter internal self-assessment checklist to actually see where the gaps are because business continuity can be a fairly overwhelming and broad process so you want to focus on a particular roadmap for the next let's say 12 to 18 months where you're going to invest your efforts and your, uh, uh, yeah, your improvements instead of getting too uh, bogged down with everything, everything at the same time. Um, and you could think about that notification platform as one of the quick wins um, so people actually being able to communicate quickly to each other in a streamlined way. A couple of um, uh, final uh, offers here. There's um, uh, best practice training out there. I'm running one in, in Kuala Lumpur at the moment, but I do that regularly in Australia as well. Uh, there's a course coming up in Brisbane in July. So if uh, any of you feel that you or one of your colleagues want to know more about this process and doing it properly in-house and or internally in your business, um, yeah, your best way may be to actually get uh, some of your people trained. So please consider that. Um, and also the BCP template kit, that framework that I mentioned. If you want to start with something, uh, not from scratch, but something that's pre-populated, um, you can save some time there. And these are the, um, uh, the two things I just mentioned. And a 10% discount for all the uh, Professional Advantage webinar delegates out there. Um, uh, if, you, if you're enjoying this, uh, this webinar and, um, and you're obviously part of the Professional Advantage community, yes, you're definitely uh, entitled to get that, uh, that discount. So please let us know if that's uh, of interest to you. Okay, the last slide. Um, yeah, just have a look at the bottom left here and consider if you're, if you're a Todd uh, or if you know a Todd in your business, 
uh, I would say you have a reason to start worrying about your BCP capability. Many building sites have this as their only way to deal with, uh, with disasters and certainly I hope that most of the business out there and some of you listeners, listeners out there, participants, uh, that you don't end up with this as your plan because uh, it is obviously a huge challenge to deal with that kind of thing. Thank you, Rinska. Okay. So uh, in, in the last 10, 15 minutes, uh, I just want to take through a little bit more on the subset of disaster recovery. So Rinska mentioned that um, DR was a, was a subset of, of business continuity planning. And, um, you know, she mentioned that we, we've seen a few uh, environmental factors recently, the floods, earthquakes, those sort of things. The, the one that caught my attention over uh, recent years was, was this one. I had somebody ask me if that was uh, where Labor sat in Queensland and uh, despite the jokes, no, it wasn't, but uh, it was where a three-storey building sat in Guatemala. Uh, that picture is not a hoax. You can go to National Geographic and uh, that, that three-storey building did literally drop off the face of the earth. So, fascinating one, that one. With the cloud, uh, we've seen a, a greater rise in attention to, to commercial disasters um, and the disruptions that they cause as well. But I must admit, from, from my experience, it's, it's largely, um, the, the, maybe natural disasters can be seen as the biggest risk to the business, but what the most likely risk to the business is, is more man-made and human factors. So over the, the 13 odd years I've been working with uh, IT infrastructure disaster recovery services, um, it's these things that you see on your screen now that, that have caused um, regular problems for most everyday businesses. Uh, I've seen burst water pipes take uh, multiple racks, uh, an entire organisation's IT systems offline and due to the lack of uh, disaster recovery solutions and planning in place, uh, it took them over a week to get back online. I've seen parts failures, explosions of power supplies inside servers um, cause such disruption that, that the vendor who they even had warranty support with had to make um, you know, three separate trips back to the organisation to resolve that and, and days to get that business back up online. And these things are regular things that, that happen um, you know, in some aspect to, uh, to clients uh, across Australia um, you know, each year. So, I wanted to take you through a little bit around the, the disaster recovery options you have available because they're, they're a lot more accessible today than they were. Um, but to, to understand that, I, I just want to take a little bit of a, a step through the evolution of disaster recovery. Um, Off-site tape is, is what most organisations have had historically and, and to be realistic, today is what most organisations still rely on. Um, it, it provides a high capacity and, and a, a long-term retention. Obviously, the tape can be taken off-site. The key is to ensuring that people do that, um, and that's not always adhered to. Um, but it is a slow mechanism. So what we've seen more recently is the advent of disk-based backup, where uh, the, the backup can occur at multiple times throughout the day, copied to disk. It's very fast to, to uh, backup, and it's also very fast, fast to restore. And it now means that backing up the tape, we really have a 24-hour backup window to do so. Virtualization has seen an increase in, in systems such as off-site backup replication and, and bandwidth availability as well. So what we're now seeing is that, that the backup is not just simply on tape and then, uh, sorry, on disk and then on tape to take off-site. We simply electronically back it up locally and then replicate that to a secondary site or now uh, some organisations are even replicating it to the cloud. And if you need the highest level of, of disaster recovery availability, off-site system replication is where we're really taking all of system, um, not just the data, but we're taking all systems and backing up to a secondary site. We've got a whole other site full of infrastructure and servers and networking. It's very expensive, but it's for organisations who really need a high level of availability. So one site can go down, the secondary site continues to keep on running. But things, as I said, have really simplified with disaster recovery. It's brought, um, uh, sorry, disaster recovery to the masses. It's made it much more accessible. And so those means really are that we can back up the entire systems now, not just the data. Um, we can also restore to the similar hardware. So we don't need to have the same full replica of hardware that we do have at a production site. We could potentially have um, less there we can restore it to, to those dissimilar types of server hardware. It doesn't need to be exactly matching processes, etc. 
and we can bring things up very quickly. So we have customers that really, with anywhere within um, you know four to six hours, we can get their systems back up and running at a secondary site uh, should the primary site you know impact uh, disaster. And, and finally, there we've also got isolated DRT testing, which means. We can now avoid the, the rigours of having to do testing after hours or, or in, interrupt business systems. Because systems are virtualised on that secondary environment, we can now bring them up and test that DR during normal production hours uh, and ensure that that's operational. So disaster recovery is affordable now to an extent, but, but ultimately it depends on what your recovery objectives are as to just how affordable. So, the recovery point objective is how much data can your business afford to lose. What that means is if I'm backing up the night before and I have an outage at say 4pm the following day, I'm probably going to lose all that data. Can I afford to lose that? So what's our recovery point that we're trying to get to? Is it within an hour, uh, you know, eight hours with a day, you know, what's, what's suitable for us? And the recovery time objective is how quickly can we get those systems restored? Can we restore them within a day, two days, two hours? You know, and, and really the cost of downtime, you can see at the bottom there, that will be what defines the answer to that recovery time objective. But establishing the business case still today for most of the organisations we engage with seems to be the, the hard point, the, 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 the roadblock, I guess, to, to getting to a disaster recovery solution or a better disaster recovery solution. So I've just got a few tips here. Um, one, obviously, review the current capability. Nothing that I'm going to tell you is rocket science, but hopefully it just lays it out a little bit clearer. And, and align with the business strategies and objectives. So what I mean by that is if your organisation has a goal to be the most reliable supplier in your industry of goods or services, yet your disaster recovery plan doesn't exist and you may be offline for a period of three, four days to recover, then all that strategy goes out the window. All that planning and marketing and messaging to the industry is gone because people will not trust that you can deliver anymore. So that's the first key. Make sure you align with whatever strategies or objectives you have in the business. The second one for financial controls, uh, they love this one, reuse existing systems where possible. Most organisations will take their production equipment as it gets old, move it to a secondary site or, or a component of that to enable that disaster recovery. But I encourage you not to hang on for it too long because uh, you know, if, it, if it's not suitable for some form of operation, then it's not suitable for the disaster recovery environment, obviously. The most important one, I think, is understand that the cost's not linear. And, and what that means is you, know, you can be offline for an hour or maybe a day, and the business won't see that it has much impact. But don't assume now that being offline for five days just has five times the impact of, of your outage for one day. We don't have the manual processes or capabilities any longer to operate without our business systems in place efficiently. And the stresses that that will put on the business and the staff as that time further goes on will dramatically increase. And I saw that largely with the organisation that had the, the worst first water pipe and, and was offline for about a week. The pressures that mounted in those last few days of their outage was, were, were enormous. So, it's not also just all about IT. You know, for those who are, are, are IT-related roles online, you need to engage with the other components of the business to understand what the impacts are. Um, you know, think about your marketing departments. What is the cost of them to build a pipeline that drives the business in the first place? In the sales departments, understand what what in opportunity at any point in time, typically the business could also lose under a disaster if you're unable to service a customer. You might need to speak to operations people, HR people, but the business case will be driven by those business units as to what they need. So to be prepared, make sure uh, in being preparing for a disaster, you identify the critical systems and prioritise them. Not all systems will need to have a disaster recovery plan around them. Some will be less critical than others. Um, make sure that you have a list and understand in what order you need to bring things back up online as well. I know this one seems obvious, but every time in these sessions when we give these seminars, I say keep your DR plan up to date. Everybody nods. And when I ask them, is your DR plan up to date, everybody shakes their head. So make sure that you know that's something that you do as you say you should. Um, and regularly test your DR plan. I like to say if you don't test your DR plan, you don't have a DR plan don't know how it's going to operate when you require it. 
this one's probably close to our uh, minds as a, as a recent uh, uh, rescue of, a, of, a, of an organisation. Uh, we turned up on site and they, they had a significant outage and uh, we asked them where their system documentation was. Unfortunately, it was on the system that was out and offline and that recovery time took probably 10 times longer than it should have. Uh, I know it sounds logical, but it's logical occurring. And ultimately, know when to fail over and fail back. You don't want to have a scenario where you've got a, a number of individuals in the heat of the moment having to make a decision and, and disagreements or, or a lack of surety about the process. You know, put some metrics around them. Yes, they need to be malleable. You'll need to work within the, the constraints of the situation you're in, but try and have some sort of framework around um, you know, what constitutes a disaster recovery situation for your organisation. Most importantly though, risk mitigation, if you can avoid a disaster, we all know that's going to be the best scenario. So there's a few things there. Risk mitigation, look, planning's not going to avoid the disaster, but it may avoid the, the, uh, the size of the disaster. So your plans, your BCP plans, your disaster recovery plans are part of that risk mitigation. Um, preventative systems are really about the resiliency aspects. Um, you know, having resilient servers or security systems or internet access, just so that you don't go into a mode of, of disaster recovery, um, you know, if you can avoid it. Also, we need to look now at, at detective systems so that we can identify any um, issues that come into place, monitoring and alerting type systems. They're really important. They can identify things pre-failure and, and, again, avoid systems and outages. Uh, sorry, avoiding the outages. And finally, the corrective component. Unfortunately, with defective, we, uh, the detective, we see too often that organisations have monitoring and alerting type systems in place, but they're not actually reviewing those alerts that could correct the systems before they lead to disasters anyway. So if you're going to put those systems in place, have the processes in there to ensure that those things are corrected uh, along the way. Business as usual, Rinsco is, is happy to engage around business continuity planning. We know we've had interest in the past from these sort of events. And, and of course, Professional Advantage can assist with your disaster recovery, your IT focus. So we really thank you for joining us today. We look forward to uh, seeing you at our next event or uh, perhaps engaging with you after this one. And uh, we look forward to that then. Thank you. <laughs>